So I propose that we uh, open uh, this afternoon plenary lecture uh, that will be given by Carl Winslow. Uh, Carl is professor in the Department of uh, Science Education at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. Uh, he is very actively uh, engaged in international mathematics education community uh, he, in particular, was member of the IRMI board uh, since 2013 until last year. And his current research interest pertains to uh, lesson studies in mathematics. So I think this is why uh, he is closely, it is not why, but uh, this is his connection to Japan. And he also uh, is interested in task design uh, mostly at the upper secondary and university level. So his, uh, today's talk uh, will address uh, several transitions to and within university mathematics. So please, Carl, it's up to you. Uh, so maybe before that, uh, I can just say that uh, these uh, days are really strange to all of us and uh, instead of being in road silence uh, we are now in our homes most of us trying to uh, keep up with uh, duties we wouldn't have had if we were in road island i'm also beginning to teach uh, online and uh, <clears throat> so uh, getting used to this new situation as, as probably most of you are um, my talk will not reflect this reality. I'm, it's, uh, my, I've chosen to talk uh, to give a, a modified version of a talk uh, I gave uh, uh, some years ago in, in Korea, and it's a kind of light introduction to uh, areas of research I've been working with for many years. Uh, also, with a focus for those of you who are not specially interested in university mathematics education. Uh, so those of you can think uh, about uh, how to relate some of the theoretical ideas I present to your projects and, and more broadly this so-called uh, anthropological approach that I will be presenting. So, But uh, the research subject that I will try to focus on and, and give an, uh, uh, an entry to is, is uh, what, what you see there in the title transitions to and within uh, university mathematics, two meaning from pre-university education to university mathematics. Uh, and in fact, also a little bit from university mathematics back to uh, secondary school. Okay, so the menu of the talk uh, is first, I will give a very short introduction to the research area of university mathematics education and and to the anthropological approach. So that's where you can uh, focus on, on the last part if you are not so interested in, in the university level. And the second part, I will take up the first specific research topic uh, that I've been working with and I think still is very interesting and, and uh, uh, ought to be studied more, namely uh, the relations between uh, research and teaching at the university in mathematics. So how do the two relate, uh, inform each other, uh, uh, and so on. This is of course a very specific uh, condition of university teachers to be also usually researchers and that will be the first topic. The second one is then uh, another transition from uh, so about uh, not the transition between teaching and research, but of students from high school to university and, and also back again. So basically the first transition from pre-university to university is a, a rather <clears throat> extensively studied area in university mathematics education and we'll take a look at what the anthropological approach can offer to that. And then finally a conclusion. So, <clears throat> um, some of you have uh, know that there is a, 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 a thematic working group on, uh, at SEAMA also at, on research and university mathematics. So, this is the area uh, I'm, I've been working on uh, mostly for the past uh, many years. Also, lesson study is another area, but in fact, it, it is not my main area of research. Um, 
and uh, <clears throat> there's even also an international conference and this coming up in September, the Indrum conference. So please take a look at that if you uh, are missing going to conferences as soon as everything will open up again. Okay, uh, in this area, there are several current directions uh, such as studies of uh, the current practice of mathematics education in universities. So there's always also in other areas, this uh, uh, possibility to simply study and document uh, uh, what is um, what what is the state of, of the practice. And uh, this is done by many different theoretical approaches and organizations and so on. Uh, APAS is one of the very classical ones, advanced mathematical thinking as well. Um, and there are, some, there are different organizations, the WUMA group in the United States uh, and so on and so forth. And many groups specialized at this at different conferences, uh, including ICMA, which is canceled this year. Sam, I already mentioned uh, the Francophone conferences, PME and so on. Uh, another direction is instead of just describing what is the case, then experimenting innovative ways to organize the practice. One of the first to take this direction in university mathematics uh, research was uh, uh, Michelle Artig with her thesis in 84, but also others uh, in this French didactical engineering tradition have pursued uh, this sort of more experimental approach to the area. And then of course, later on, we have uh, other forms of design-based research that has been uh, deployed at the university level. In fact, you can consider APAS also to some extent, uh, a design-based uh, or design-oriented approach with this. Um, <clears throat> and um, of course, one of the, the interesting areas of innovation is uh, uh, using technology such as the use of graphic software to teach differential equations. This was actually the topic of Michel's, uh, Michel Artique's uh, uh, engineering back in the, 19, the early 1980s, and, uh, but a lot of other types of interventions, task design and so on. Uh, and uh, then we also have uh, broader studies of mathematicians' practices. So not just uh, strictly speaking, the practice of teaching. Uh, one of the most uh, base, I mean, fundamental ones is the study by Leon Burton um, from uh, 2004 in uh, mathemat Mathematicians as Inquirers where she interviews, I think, 72 uh, mathematicians about their, their research practice and also a little bit about their teaching. There's also the study of misfelds of mathematicians writing, 2006. Often comparing then their practice as researchers with their practice as teachers. And as Bertrand notes, uh, there seems to be a certain gap between mathematicians' view of mathematical knowing when they act as researchers and that encountered by learners both in school and at university. So, so that gap is of course quite interesting from a didactical perspective. Uh, key questions in the area, how to delimit and model what is university mathematics relations to other forms of mathematics and what could be meant by form here. This is of course where the ATG approach has some takes. What if anything is special about university teaching of mathematics? What specific research questions? I mean, some might be rather similar to research on mathematics education at other levels. How to relate different activity types uh, that are characteristic of university fact, uh, teachers, especially research and teaching, and so on. So the anthropological approach that I will introduce here uh, <coughs> Uh, I mean more specifically the ATD, the anthropological theory of the didactical. So you will now get a little crash course in in this, along with um, with uh, some examples. Uh, before I go into the examples of how it applies to university mathematics education, it's a research program initiated by French uh, Yves Chevalier in the early 1980s and developed later by together with many other colleagues. 
It considers mathematics as a kind of human activity and knowledge situated in the institution. So institutions play a, an important role as in any anthropological theory. And uh, a key point is to relate and differentiate uh, what we could call informally practice and theory. And I, I will explain immediately what that means. Uh, we use uh, ATD tools to uh, perhaps first of all, and this is probably a, a rather original character of this approach, to model the mathematical activity and knowledge involved in, in the didactic phenomena we study. So we, we don't just take mathematics at face value, but we actually create explicit models of uh, mathematical activity and, and uh, also more theoretical knowledge. This is done with a tool called praxeologies or praxeological organizations. So in particular, when we consider mathematics, uh, we talk of a mathematical organization of praxeologies, uh, consisting then of one of or more types of tasks. Of course, this is characteristic of a lot of mathematical activity to be focused around uh, not just arbitrary tasks, but tasks that sort of occur in classes that can be attacked by a technique. So a praxeology also contains one or more techniques. And so that is the, the first two there, the, 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 the practice. And then the theory is the, the last two, technology, discourse on techniques, and uh, theory, which is a little bit uh, more the organizing of technology in, in more formal and overarching ways. Theories help also um, connecting praxeologies among each other. Um, so that's a very important tool. Uh, it's a little illustration where you have the type of task and the technique uh, in the practice block there at the bottom. And then on top of that, as a kind of uh, superstructure, the technology discourse about the techniques and the theory. Maybe you have seen this before. We will not go much into details with Praxeological analysis here, but it's a very important part of, of the approach that we that we can mod make such models. Models. We also model the context, sometimes called the institutional ecology of mathematical organizations. So where they live, what makes them live, uh, the context in which they are, are taught, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> and it, institutions are then viewed as systems of positions that individuals may adopt relative to praxeologies for instance, as teachers, as students, as researchers, uh, and so on, teacher students. Um, the theory offers tools to analyze different levels of institutional constraints, which contribute to determine the way praxeologies uh, develop in, in the institutions. And uh, we also insist often, especially in in design-oriented projects and the importance of uh, various resources and their interplay. Um, so these are some of the features of this theoretical approach uh, that we will look at. Um, okay, so now I offer you uh, a bird's eye view of what I want to, uh, to talk about here. In fact, it's a kind of uh, rough institutional model of different kinds uh, and distillations of mathematics in different institutions. So, of course, mathematics education at university level is, is, is this. This is the object of study, tertiary education courses and programs in mathematics. But then, uh, as I already mentioned, we are also interested in another kind of mathematical, uh, of mathematics, so to speak, a research discipline, which is in fact probably the oldest one uh, existing at, at universities today, because it goes back uh, 3,000, 4,000 years. And it's also a very dynamic one, uh, expanding one. And of course, these two forms of mathematics exist within the university institution, primarily, also to elsewhere. But for simplicity, let's say that's mathematics at university. Then on the other side, what probably is interesting, most of you, is, is a third type of mathematics, namely the school subjects, uh, which is also uh, taught 
uh, to almost everyone in our societies and in any country in the world. So that's, of course, uh, with variations, you can say it's not just one subject, it depends on, on details like where it's taught and so on. But very broadly speaking, we can say that's uh, the mathematics in the school institutions. And then do we have more kinds of mathematics than that? Yes. What motivates the, the other one, ones in a certain sense is that we have mathematics as a vital component in practices in society, for instance, in technology and natural sciences, financial institutions and so on. And we make that a little bit of a, a mess box where we put all the rest elsewhere, outside the university and outside of the school. Okay. But one of the characteristics of the anthropological approach is to permit such a broad view so that we do not just focus in university mathematics education on the narrow setting of the tertiary education courses, for instance. And then in ATD, we sometimes talk of the didactic transposition for the school subject, so that locates easily what we mean by that. So the, the transposition of scholarly knowledge from the research discipline and also from mathematical practices in society, we can locate there, but that's just an aside. So in fact, there are many relations there that we could, cons could uh, uh, let's say, theoretically be interested in. The, the ones I have chosen to focus on here with the two specific research subtopics I showed you in the introduction are just those. So the interaction between um, university mathematics education and university research was the first one and the second one the <clears throat> interaction between university education and, and school education in mathematics okay so just to take a, a little look at the, what is inside those boxes i will start by a little example concerning linear regression so uh, how does that appear when we look at the uh, research mathematics box well, of course, we could study it, many, study it in many different ways. The most easy, of course, is to look at documents from research. So this is a research paper. It's not completely new from 1996. And we could begin analyzing how, how it uh, represents uh, mathematical praxeology with a task type there. Uh, estimation in linear models, there is a technique uh, indicated and, of course, further explained in the paper. And there's a theoretical context that we recognize uh, here in the keywords that sort of indicates where, where's the theory, and that's just the beginning, but we can immediately recognize those elements there. Uh, how does it the same phenomenon, linear regression, appear in, in a society or outside of, of mathematics in a certain sense? Uh, well, for instance, in, here's a practice from natural science where a very very commonly you have a set of data and you want to create a model from that data without having any theoretical way to do it typically and then you just plot your in, in case it's a two-dimensional data set you plot it like that or could we also do it with more than one two dimensions and then you get a linear model uh, usually based on a technology uh, of, i mean computer technology of some sort. Or in uh, <clears throat> finance, this is uh, from a website on terms from finance. There's the line of best fits, sometimes also called the trend line. Um, so it's a phenomenon you can recognize there again with as a technique for a certain type of task, uh, as a theory context indicated, and there's a lot of um, technology that is uh, discourse about how to apply and, and uh, deploy this technique. And then finally, the school subjects, uh, the same phenomenon, but perhaps not exactly the same, right? Because all of these are in different institutional contexts. So we could find it, for instance, in textbooks. And I have taken the liberty to show you a Danish high school textbook. I don't expect you to read the details. But again, here we see uh, some informal theory first. So there's a definition. Definitions usually 
indicate uh, that the text is about to uh, set up some some uh, elements of, of the theory of the praxeality, which is also further detailed later in the text. There's immediately an indication of some instrumented techniques uh, to be used in this context, uh, to some uh, mathematics tool program and, and so on. So we could analyze it again with the aid of, of praxeologies. And then, uh, oh, it seems it, it jumped a little bit. Uh, no. Uh, so here we have the boxes again. Uh, finally, uh, as a component in tertiary education, currently, mm, I just note in passing that uh, regression models were not at all part of tertiary education in mathematics at the time I studied. It was not part of the school subject either, but now it, it seems to be taught right from lower secondary school. So how does it appear in tertiary education? Well, mainly in statistics courses. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, um, there's a lot of focus there in, in many university texts on the more theoretical aspects like justifying uh, various methods here. The most basic case of uh, the, the two-dimensional linear regression. Uh, so it's theoretical justification of practices was the way most of this calculation to der derive the formula can be uh, can be um, interpreted. Okay, so that was just examples. Now I, I come to the first. Uh, of the two specific research topics that I will outline, the crucial relation between research and teaching at university. Uh, we could start by considering a classical analogy uh, uh, formulated by Guy Brousseau in, in his seminal uh, paper from 86, where he uh, <clears throat> explains uh, what he considers an analogy between the student's work and the mathematician's work. Namely, that both faced with a task try to adapt their personal knowledge to solve the task and then uh, somehow have to depersonalize it to explain and justify it to others. And he considers this as uh, so a question and personal knowledge turned into new personal knowledge and finally turned into shared knowledge. This, of course, perhaps a little bit optimistic view of the student's work, but it, it certainly does seem to. to uh, give a rough model of what a researcher does. Opposite, he says, is the teacher's work. Uh, <clears throat> so you have you start with shared knowledge that you want to teach, and you need to turn it into more or less interesting and challenging questions for students to work on. Um, so this kind of opposite situation of teaching and research uh, then uh, perhaps uh, could be a starting point for considering what is special about university teaching. Uh, well, in fact, for the university teacher, who is often a researcher uh, in the discipline he teaches, these two opposite tasks uh, could be considered adversary or similar. Uh, adversary in the case where they sort of, for instance, because they compete for your time, um, but uh, but in fact, as we shall see, uh, practitioners also to some extent consider them similar, uh, which is interesting, of course, if you want to promote the um, positive connections between the two. So in research, uh, to summarize, we also find that the university teachers of mathematics rarely consider their teaching as and research as directly interacting in ways which we can, in fact, find in other fields. So for instance, they find it very rare that they can make students participate in their research. So if there's a connection, it's, it's more indirect. So I will say a little bit more about a study of this interaction between research and teaching at university that I did some years ago with a colleague in physical geography, because there it becomes, especially when you have this comparative lens, so you look at how is, is this interaction working in two different disciplines, you are more uh, capable of seeing what, what is special about uh, each of them. 
For sure, this interaction is a fundamental condition in universities at any level, uh, at any discipline, and, and so on. Um, what does it mean to the two activities? What does it mean to the teachers? Does it mean anything to the students? Do they even realize that teachers are researchers? Uh, and could this re interaction be optimized in some ways? Uh, so, and in particular, of course, didacticians may be interested in how the closeness of research could be beneficial to teaching, right? Especially from this point of view of Burton that I quoted before because of this gap between mathematicians' views as, as researchers and teachers, uh, could this be perhaps optimized or improved? And uh, for this study, comparative study I mentioned, we did interview studies with 10 professors of mathematics and physical geography. Uh, and analyzed them based on an ATD model of research and teaching. And I just outlined it here. So we consider the disciplinary praxeology, so the XOs are mathematical and physical geography praxeologies. And around them, there are more uh, general praxeologies of research on the left, RO, and didactical praxeologies on the right. So this is a rough model of, of the interaction of praxeologies that we are interested in, in investigating in this study. And we did in fact identify some interesting differences between the two disciplines that in particular perhaps say something about, uh, about the case of mathematics. So we could summarize that as the, the closeness by analogy but not by identity in any way of research organizations and didactical organizations. So for the teachers, the mathematicians, many point to the didactic tasks of creating student tasks, so uh, inventing innovative exercises, as one which involve also mathematical tasks, which for them appear similar to their work in research. So this is how one mathematician expresses that. I will go as far as to say that I use the same part of my head to construct exam tasks and to do research. So it is in a way something creative and also satisfactory when you have made a good collection of exam tasks. And of course, a similar satisfaction may be experienced uh, when having uh, written a good paper or something like that. Yeah proved a theorem or whatever. Uh, and mathematicians, in fact, aim to give their students tasks that in turn, so it's actually a little bit the Brosonian spirit that, that give the students an experience similar to the research. I remember this analogy that Brousseau mentions <coughs> between the work of the student and the work of the uh, researcher. So here's another quote. It's one thing to solve a research problem and clearly He's talking about a course he gives in first year. Clearly the first year students don't do that. So you don't expect first year students in mathematics to solve the a big uh, research problem. But to try to give them an experience which resembles what you do in research, that I think we do or try to do. Give them rather open tasks. That is where there's not just one place in the textbook to find the method or indeed a unique answer. Uh, but we also need to avoid to break their necks. So there's a, uh, a kind of analogy between the experience that students are supposed to have and, and that of research, but it's certainly not an identity for many reasons. For instance, because it would be too, I mean, out of, out of the reach of students, of course. So we can, uh, besides uh, noting these and other interesting observations of how <coughs> this link is viewed by mathematicians, we can also note uh, a kind of <coughs> de design problem. Ah, sorry, I, uh, I think I will jump this slide actually and not talk about the different transitions here but rather jump to the didactic design challenge that sort of comes out of this and which we have been working on in many uh, uh, then uh, uh, let's say uh, 
uh, more experimental projects uh, in my university and in, in others also. So the challenge is to design didactic praxeologies for for the transition from purely um, practical work to to more theoretical work. Yeah, maybe I should have actually not have jumped that, but um, but the transition of type one is is the transition that operates often at the beginning of university between courses that mainly focus on standard uh, techniques to courses which also involve theory. So then to develop uh, uh, didactic praxeologies that can help students develop theory blocks from practice blocks. So uh, develop so that students are aimed at developing autonomous theoretical reasoning uh, based on, on familiar practice blocks. So then uh, one strategy to do that is to create tasks for students that will mobilize theory. And this is uh, an idea that is, of course, especially important then in, in uh, uh, let's say, semi-advanced courses and in more advanced courses. Uh, there's also the second type of transition where we develop practice blocks from theory blocks. So we begin to consider the theory uh, as something that uh, that uh, can uh, also be routinized. Uh, and so there are certain patterns of, of reasoning and so on, which you can can routinize. And so in this case, the challenge for the designer is to create tasks that require the creation of, of uh, theory. Two crucial uh, requirements for such design work at the university level. Alignment with the institutional constraints on teachers and students, especially, I would say, examination practices, but also other things like the rest of the program, what is the course uh, depending on and where does it lead. Uh, and uh, also, uh, I would say an important uh, variable for such design is uh, the management of media and tools, like what resources do students uh, have access to, uh, what, which ones should they uh, be, be uh, encouraged to use and so on, if they are really going to engage, for instance, in autonomous uh, and creative work with mathematical theory. So I will just finish this first specific research topic by saying that uh, there's a number of papers uh, from my own lab that, that pursues uh, these uh, challenges in different ways. That's the end of the purely university mathematics education one and now, uh, part. And now I will also briefly look at this other link between university mathematics education and uh, school mathematics education. Um, uh, so, of, co of course, there could be many lenses on, on this, but uh, a very important one is that uh, uh, the teachers in school mathematics usually have a past in university mathematics of some sort. So there is a, 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 I mean, in some sense, you could say that mathematics teacher education, uh, uh, at least one one element of that is 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 uh, closely related to this relation between tertiary mathematics uh, education and and then the school practice, and this is one of the um, uh, oldest uh, subjects in a, in a way in mathematics education. <laughs> it is uh, related to the famous double discontinuity problem of Felix Klein formulated in his book from 1908. Uh, if you don't know uh, this, I, I will uh, just introduce it very briefly uh, because it very clearly describes uh, two, uh, the two relations as, as uh, somehow problematic or discontinuous. So he writes in the preface of this book from 1908, uh, fundamental mathematics from a higher standpoint. He writes, at the beginning of his university studies, the young student is faced with problems that in no way reminds him, remind him of the mathematical things he worked with in school. Naturally, he then forgets these matters quickly and thoroughly. So that is the transition from school mathematics to university mathematics, uh, which uh, many of you perhaps have experienced yourself as uh, 
if not problematic, then at least as a discontinuity. So, so there seems to be a jump there in different ways. But then also Klein continues, if he, sorry for the gender uh, bias, but <laughs> at the time, I guess most university students and mathematics teachers were his, but so I'll just read it in Klein's formulation. If he becomes a teacher after having finished his studies, so he has been at university, decides to become a mathematics teacher, he must suddenly teach this time or not elementary mathematics, the school mathematics, in a school-like fashion, so in this institutional context. And as he cannot by himself see the connection between this task of teaching and university mathematics, his university studies become just a more or less present, pleasant memory, which has no influence on his teaching. So there you have the transition back from university mathematics to school mathematics, in some sense, it's the same discontinuity, but it's altogether not exactly the same because now it's in the role as teacher that, uh, and with, uh, I mean, this in the background that that the discontinuity is, is experienced. So this second transition from university back to school, usually uh, we could, at least in our country, mainly think of high school in this connection. Um, well, uh, how could it be studied more thoroughly and perhaps uh, worked with? Well, we could work with uh, examples or instances. So, where the institutional status of math mathematical practicalities, which seem similar, are in fact quite different. So, one example that we have pursued in some papers is uh, what is to be done and known about exponential functions, for instance. Well, uh, uh, I just posed the question, we don't have time to go into the details, but then uh, a common uh, strategy to work with this gap in a constructive way is uh, and I'm sure many of you in some ways have experiences with attending or teaching courses for teachers, which are meant to um, to bridge uh, between advanced uh, mathematical methods and viewpoints and the task of teaching high school subjects. Uh, so in these courses, uh, then uh, the idea is to try to invest and help the students to see how, how to, they can invest their university mathematics background in getting a deeper understanding of things like the exponential functions uh, or other elements of, of high school mathematics, or school mathematics more generally. So, uh, coming back to the example we looked at first, well, the idea in a capstone course is to systematize previous work uh, with mathematical praxeologies into a more complete praxeology and also one which is more uh, explicitly linked to the praxeologies taught in high school and, and adapted to them. So, for example, in the case of linear regression and uh, considering the tasks involved in teaching linear regression, you could take uh, a look back at the university texts, maybe your statistics textbook, where this was uh, more or less covered, sort out the details in the proof of the formula for the least square methods, for example, from statistics courses, and then consider uh, uh, to what extent is, is this proof you saw it briefly when we looked at it with um, partial derivatives and Hessian matrices and so on. Is, is it suitable for high school students? It is probably not. And if not, uh, take a look, uh, I mean, investigate if you can elementarize or create uh, an approach which is more suitable for this level, and but still investing your uh, university mathematical background. Time for conclusion, uh, a little bit more generally. Uh, the ATD as, as an approach to transition phenomena uh, is characterized by uh, 
uh, actually explicitly modeling mathematical activity and knowledge as situated in different institutional contexts that shape and constrain the activity in these institutional contexts. And uh, also uh, then uh, explicitly we'll see, we have a model of the, the gaps and, and uh, uh, what gives, uh, I mean, uh, gives uh, cause for these transition phenomena. Uh, model space on the ATD achieves, aims to achieve an appropriate distance to the phenomena you study. So something you model explicitly, uh, you don't just take for granted, but you can begin questioning the adequacy of the models and so on. <coughs> and this is important because because uh, in uh, mathematics education, we study practices that we are in various ways participating in. So if we take too many things for granted, we don't really study them, but we just uh, in some sense describe our, describe them from a very personal point of view. So this gesture of creating an approach to create distance between ourselves and the objects we study is of course a very fundamental gesture in research. and. Uh, one which, which, which these uh, praxeological models then uh, helps to get with respect to, to the mathematical practices, for instance. Models permit a relation between highly specific analysis of specific content. So you can go into to very detailed uh, analysis of things like exponential functions in different institutions and uh, also more global and general phenomena such as uh, uh, theoretical uh, uh, levels, uh, uh, institutional constraints, societal conditions and so on. So you have, will notice that it's characteristic for the ATD approach to, to uh, combine in a connected way, both rather specific and small scale and, uh, object analysis and also th this wider perspective. And then, uh, <coughs> praxeologists offer a very flexible model modeling tool uh, to relate and compare different organizations of human activity. I have already shown you the example of the study of how research and teaching praxeologists uh, interacts or how they interact differently in different disciplines. Uh, the ATD does not only provide descriptive models, as this lecture may have uh, primarily given uh, an impression of, but also related tools for intervention. You may have heard of study and research paths, which is, is one currently quite popular, focusing on specific approaches to uh, praxeologists uh, to be taught. And I have shown you a little bit of a little indication of the design of tasks that we have been systematically uh, uh, pursuing in mathematics. Sorry, I got too fast there. I just wanted the last point there. Ah, oh, yeah. So finally, uh, a characteristic of the ATD approach is to uh, try to break with the individualistic view of mathematical activity that pervades a lot of research in more cognitive approaches. So, and in fact, recognize that a lot of the practices uh, we pursue are, are institutionally determined rather than individually determined, even if this individualistic viewpoint is quite popular and prevalent, uh, especially also perhaps in, in universities. So this was a, a very quick overview of some things I like to talk about and uh, think about. So. Now I think the organizers will organize a little break to uh, formulate questions, but this is what is next at least. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Carl, for your very interesting and inspiring lecture.